Hey everyone, my name is Jake from Umbrella IT Services, and today we're going to be interviewing Yaroslav Pensarsky from Origami Internet. He's going to be teaching us about SharePoint for local businesses. So if you're a local business, local organization, local charity, and you're using SharePoint as an intranet for your organization, this video is for you. So without any further ado, let's jump into it. And I'd like to give Yaroslav from Origami Software a big thank you for coming on and talking with us today about SharePoint for local businesses and how it can benefit them. So again, Yaroslav, thank you so much for coming on. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into this industry and uh, how you're helping local businesses out with SharePoint? Yeah, thank you, Jake, uh, for having me. So uh, yeah, my name is Yaroslav Pensarski. I'm a digital work workplace advisor for Origami Software. And we're a local SaaS company specializing in uh, pre-built SharePoint intranets. Um, let's see how I got started. So about 16 years ago, I started working for a, a local consulting company uh, doing SharePoint as my first project. And uh, true story, it was a huge pain, uh, but we all got to start somewhere, right? So uh, so at the time I was you know, kind of just getting things started and I was, Kind of working through through with this company saw that there's a lot of businesses and a lot of organizations that are using SharePoint that I wasn't even aware of that it's a thing. Um, you know, obviously, 15, 16 years ago, um, and uh, but you know, I accepted the challenge. I, I like the fact that it's used so uh, so frequently and and a lot of organizations. So I accepted the challenge, decided to put all my effort in it, started blogging, writing, speaking about it, uh, sharing some pains and some thoughts uh, with, with people out there. And, uh, and then, you know, few, fast forward a few years, uh, got into, you know, running my own company and, and uh, doing pre-built intranets. So that's, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. That's awesome. And you're right, you do definitely have to put in the put in the time in IT. You always start at the bottom of the pile and then you work your way up. So um, yep. you said a couple of things already that I just want to break down. So you said SaaS company. So that's software as a service. So what exactly is a software as a service company? So software as a service, uh, essentially, rather than you running software in your server room, you know, and in, 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 uh, in a closet, uh, you purchase the software. We all use things like Spotify. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm using meditation app. It's all software as a service, right? So it's uh, the software is sitting somewhere else out there in the cloud, and you're accessing it uh, from your phone, from your desktop, uh, you know, and so on. So that's that's really the, it, in a nutshell. Gotcha. And then uh, the other thing that you mentioned was uh, intranet. So I know a lot of people are confused in the difference between intranet and internet. Um, yeah. Do you mind breaking that down for us as well? Yeah. So essentially, internet is uh, you know we all know what internet is, right? It's uh, it's uh, you know you go log in online and, you, and log into websites, do shopping, and so on. So intranet is essentially a uh, a portal for internal portal for organizations, right? So you might think, uh, you know, in, in, especially in the larger organizations when you have uh, things like people need to access the HR and benefits and company news and uh, uh, forms and templates and so on, uh, rather than them accessing it from, you know, a Dropbox or some sort of file share, an intranet provides that kind of augmented experience where you can see all of your files along with news and kind of this uh, personalized very internal targeted way so that's that's really what the internet is all about gotcha so you're, you're essentially creating like an online database of uh, resources for internal staff to be able to reference and access exactly and in, in, in a form of a template gotcha and and how does microsoft sharepoint kind of tie into that so what, what is it and uh how do you leverage that tool so SharePoint is uh, is a really good sort of a framework, right? Uh, so to, for lack of a better term, to build upon, right? So um, we use SharePoint as as a backend mechanism to do uh, all the other cool stuff that companies need. So um, you know, for example, SharePoint has a capability to store files and uh, to you know for you to build pages and so on. And then we add that capability to allow uh, for it to host things like, um, you know, templates directory and, uh, uh, you know, news feed and uh, polls and uh, employee shout outs and so on. I guess another analogy you can think of it as, uh, you know, Microsoft Word, right? So Microsoft Word as a tool is a great tool, but it's not going to write documents for you. 
Uh, it's got some starting things, starting point, uh, but then you have to go and, and kind of write things and create all the beautiful proposals, wherever you use to, to create uh, uh, whatever you, you need for work. But you use that Microsoft Word as a backend. So that's kind of what we, we're doing with SharePoint. We're taking that great tool as a starting point, and then we're kind of shaping it to organization to make sure that it does what you want to do. That makes sense. So that there, there's a lot of information there to break down. But uh, what what would be some of the three main features you think that uh, every small business should be using inside of SharePoint? So definitely a file sharing, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, the capability to store files, find files, uh, you know, categorize them based on uh, what type of what type of documents are these? Or do, do they belong to a particular project? Um, another common thing that I would use is just an information hub. Right, so for you to keep, especially now when everybody's working remotely or has been for the past few months, you want to make sure that people have this one-stop shop to come in and uh, and see what's going on. We've seen a huge spike when everybody started working remotely, and that spike kind of maintained. So we want to keep that up to date, and it's, instead of people sending emails back and forth and distracting each other, uh, have that one-stop shop uh, for uh, for. Um, you know all the news and events. And another thing that you want to, you might want to do is things like, uh, you know, um, integration with some of the uh, with some of the tools. Like for example, one of my customers is using, uh, you know, all of their contracts and are digitally signed these days. And so they integrate with things like uh, uh, DocuSign for digital signatures to do okay. this compliance and and tracking of all of that work uh, in one in one spot. So these are kind of the major. Key things. So there's a bit of a there's a bit of a getting work done, a bit of a social aspect and communication aspect, um, and an employee engagement aspect. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. That and like you said, way. what what I really like about um, using different tools like SharePoint, etc., um, are the ability to kind of consolidate things and automate different procedures. Um, one of the biggest tasks that we've been doing for a lot of our clients now, ranging from maybe it's a five person financial firm all the way up to 150 person uh, studio or other sorts of firms that we manage, um, is restructuring and reorganizing. And one of the biggest tools we've been doing with this is SharePoint and Teams, uh, because we're looking at all of these different processes, all of these resources, as you mentioned, all of these platforms that people are using, and we're just figuring out a spot to kind of have everything be centralized, like you said, a one-stop shop, where people are going to be able to log in and say, what's the, the general consensus of the entire association for calendaring? What's going on in terms of news? What's the next COVID update for everybody? What are the safety measures we need to take into place? What is going on with my, like you said, DocuSign? What's going on with our case management software? What's going on with this and that? And uh, SharePoint really, really is, in my opinion, one of the best solutions out there. Um, have you noticed that Microsoft Teams is kind of encroaching on SharePoint at all for that? Because I've seen the ability now to centralize and integrate things into Google Teams <clears throat> is uh, very much becoming similar to SharePoint. Or do you think that that's not going to happen? It's uh, so absolutely. Uh, Teams is being promoted heavily right now. But if we look at the <laughs> context in which it's being promoted, right? So it's a new. It's first of all the you know SharePoint's been around for a long time. Uh, and Teams is kind of a new kid on the block. So there's a lot of investments yeah. going into promotion of that tool. It's a great tool. We're using it internally. And uh, uh, and and also Microsoft is trying to compete with other tools out there. There's, of course, we know that there is Slack, right? Everybody heard about Slack. Uh, there's Zoom, which Microsoft is heavily uh, targeting right now. Um, and uh, or competing. In my opinion, these, there are a little bit of different tools. but. Teams is definitely uh, is being promoted a lot. Um, the good news is that it's not something um, that you need to use exclusively, right? Should I use Teams or should I use SharePoint? If you think about a typical workday, right? If um, you use Teams more for, or Teams or Slack, right? For more of a communication, but you're not gonna really rely on going and storing documents there that you need to access perhaps two, two months from now or two years from now. Right, so you might have documents. You might have shared some intermediary documents with your team, um, and work while you're working on a project. But what you really want to do is you want to file it in, in SharePoint and make sure that it's accessible there, and you can easily find it rather than scrolling through the conversation two years from now trying to figure out what retrace steps, what happened, and, and how. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, uh, the, that standard question of what to use when. 
<clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. So Teams is more of an instant communication platform and an instant way to communicate and collaborate. But SharePoint is the foundation to build everything off of. I, I very much agree with that. I think that like Teams now has the ability, for example, to host SharePoint as part of the integration inside of it. Um, yeah. So personally speaking, I think that Teams, uh, again, it has similar functionality, but when it comes down to it, I think SharePoint, when it comes to hosting files and to being able to just communicate and collaborate on things, it, it can't be beat. I think you're right. Um, do you have any uh, common issues? Like what would be three common issues that most people run into when they're trying to get SharePoint running off the ground? So the well, the most common uh, kind of a challenge is like uh, you know the challenge of doing nothing, right? So mm. just kind of like uh, keeping things status quo, and uh, you know, because a lot of a lot of people kind of got burned on implementing new technologies and them kind of uh, um, you know having to roll back or not knowing how to integrate it with the rest of the ecosystem. So people have a little bit of that fear: is like, what do I do, and uh, and is it a big investment, and how big of a thing is it for me? So, um, so obviously, you want to make sure that um, that you know what your what your outcome is. So, one of the things that I usually tell to my clients is that uh, let's clearly understand what you're out, what, what are you trying to achieve, right? And what is what is the end goal that you're going to be measuring yourself against? Uh, so that's challenge number one of uh, challenge of kind of being paralyzed uh, and into doing nothing. Another challenge is to kind of uh, do it in-house, just very on very small scale. And uh, a lot of people, again, this is this fear that this may not work out. So I want to minimize my my risk. So I want to do something very small, very uh, uh, low, um, uh, not with a very insignificant investment. So the problem with that is, of course, if you um, Kind of calculate it, uh, or, or you're gonna not spend enough effort in it. You kind of, you know, you get what you paid for, right? Mm. So, uh, so you're gonna get this solution that's obviously not gonna work because you haven't really invested your full, uh, um, uh, you know, effort in it. And uh, so that, so that's challenge number two. And then the challenge number three, which is the opposite of, of the first, of the second one, is that people try to put this ideal solution, this five-year vision right now and uh, and and all of these challenges come from different types of I guess person people's personalities and also how where organization is um, so with that last one where people are trying to put too much all at once it's just kind of they're getting paralyzed by choices now and and what 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 if well what if that what if that so in that case what I usually recommend is uh, uh, you know start with a well thought out pilot and then build on the top of it. So there's a balancing kind of act between these three, uh, between these three scenarios, uh, doing nothing at all, doing too little, or doing too much. That makes sense. I, I think that's one of the reasons, again, why it's so important to speak with somebody like yourself, um, or even a, a managed services provider like myself. But um, again, having somebody with like yourself with 16 years of experience that has seen pretty much everything and anything that people can do with this this type of software um, is so important because the biggest problem that I've noticed is analysis paralysis, which I think is the yeah. last one that you're talking about, where it's okay, let's try to do this ourselves. Let's figure out what SharePoint can do okay, I've spent a half hour looking at this. There's 1500 different things that I can do just with documents. Uh, I can't, I'm not looking at this anymore. I've over, I'm overwhelmed. So it's yeah. very, very important, I think, for people to understand that, again, this is a tool that can be very simple. You can just use it to host files. You can do that yourself. You can share things very easily. You can collaborate with your team. Very easy to get that going. Uh, but yeah. if you want to properly, efficiently leverage this, it's super, super important, like you said, to lay out what metrics, what goals are you trying to accomplish and what metrics you're gonna to use to measure the, the level of success that your business is gonna attain by, by implementing this software um, so that as you're implementing it, not only are you gonna be seeing the results two or three months down the road, you're also going to be feeling the progress. Like yeah. it's very, very important for people as you're working in these kind of tools 
to understand as you're working through the project, you want to be able to look back a month in when you're feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling stressed out going, well, hey, at least now we have a way for everyone to understand the new COVID updates. And hey, we, we got this new newsletter up and running. And hey, we've got this document center sharing like all of the files for accounting in here. You know, yep. and w when you're able to write out these metrics and these goals, like you said, um, people will actually feel a little bit less overwhelmed, even though it is still quite a big project. Um, yeah. So that's one of the strategies I think is most important, but do you have any other strategies or guidelines or mindsets you recommend people kind of get into as they're starting to develop this or working with someone like yourself? Yeah, so um, essentially uh, look at the audit in terms of, try to audit uh, your organization and see what is it, what are the things that people are um, using right now and what can you replace right so so i've spoken actually just yesterday I've spoken to an organization uh mid-size organization you know 200 plus people uh and uh they are they have uh, box they've implemented box which is a file sharing solution uh, they have slack uh, which is communication solution and they have office 365 <laughs> And uh, and as well as what I said, like, well, do you, do you do you pay for Box? Right, it's a subscription. Yeah, we do. And what about Slack? Yes, we do. Uh, and then SharePoint's not really used fully, and that's why they're 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 calling. That's why we're having conversation. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, well, I said, well, do you realize that these capabilities are you know Slack is you can use Teams and uh, your Box you can use OneDrive as part of Office 365. A lot of people don't know that, right? Yeah. So people have a lot of these subscriptions, and even for us, for example, we're a small business and we have tons of subscriptions and tons of little tools that cost you a couple of hundred dollars here, a couple of hundred dollars there. This is a great tool. That is a great tool. Oh, we forgot to, re we're not using that anymore, but it's just on auto renewal. And we have dozens of tools and we're small business. So you can imagine with a 200 plus or 100 plus organization, they have even more tools yeah. that are kind of uh, running in silos. So uh, kind of uh, to, to, to kind of summarize a lot, look at the company wide uh, benefit overall and not, a, not as a silo thing, because then you're going to really save uh, not just on, you know, let's just add another tool to, to the pile. You're going to replace some of these tools that are kind of uh, rogue or sometimes, uh, um, you know, just used in a silo for, you know, a couple of people team. Uh, so this SharePoint as a tool or an Office 365 suite of tools is it gives you the most benefit when when people use it, right? It's kind of like a treadmill analogy, right? You can buy a treadmill and sit in a corner and it's not going to give you any benefit. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, if you use it and you know how to use it and you follow the routine, it'll you'll start seeing a benefit. Um, so when you're a brand new organization, if you, ha you don't, if you don't have any internet at all, look at all the tools and existing subscriptions you're already using. Involve key stakeholders. This is another important one. It involves key stakeholders. So this the, um, these are uh, line of business um, areas. Uh, it's HR, communications, and IT. So these are the four key ones. So for instance, if you're in manufacturing, make sure you involve someone from production, HR, communications, and IT. If you are, for example, in a financial services organization, right, make sure you involve someone from, uh, you know, uh, fund, you're someone from your fund accountants, for example, uh, or HR, again, communications, and IT. These are, this is your core team. Yeah. Uh, so do the audit, uh, pick the key content owners that will we'll put uh, we'll use the internet primarily. And then don't forget to uh, also prepare users to help users to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the key thing. A lot of com companies roll it out and kind of like, oh, here it is. And uh, it's important to understand it as a change and people hate change is one of the biggest things and uh, uh, understand that they will have to change some of their processes, help them adapt to new behaviors. Um, so, that's a, so that's an organization that has uh, had no internet at all. Um, if you are redesigning, so if you have an intranet right now and you're, or, or SharePoint right now and you're redesigning, understand what's changing, right? So a lot of organizations have had uh, SharePoint 10 years ago. So we worked with one company that had uh, uh, the internet uh, 20 years. Um, and they, you know, it's, you need to understand what is changing. What is, why is it changing? Uh, also, I'm trying to understand what is the content that you have right now and what is the future state? Because a lot of these things are probably going to fall off when you do that audit. Um, and then uh, you know, understand who's going to be responsible for making these decisions. And again, involve key stakeholders from the business.
So that's these are yeah. kind of a three things to prepare before you start the project. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned accountability there at the end because what I've noticed in, in my experience when, when you're doing a big project like this, and like you mentioned, multiple departments are involved, the entire company is, is being shifted over to something, and then something goes wrong, everybody just kind of stands there, points their fingers at each other on both sides of them and goes, well, it's his, his responsibility, I didn't, or it's her responsibility, I don't, I don't know. And it's so important to take them all upside and go, all right, you're in charge of HR, you're in charge of accounting, you're in charge of communications, you're in charge of the technical aspect. It's up to you to work with IT, learn about what we're doing here and relay that to your people and make sure that we're involving them, getting communications from them, getting feedback and understanding what reasons people are pushing back, what features they're asking for, what type of workflows they're trying to get through. Um, and that way, when you're implementing the solution, you only have to do it once and it's done right for 15 years. Um, there, and, and as you mentioned as well previously, there's so many people, uh, either five person marketing firms or 50 person law firms or 250 person enterprises um, that are using 18 different pieces of software. And they're also subscribed to Microsoft 365, which is giving them all of those features in one place for one eighth of what they're paying for everything else. Um, and it's very, very good to hear you say that because I've, I see a lot of other guys that go, okay, well, you should have seven or eight different platforms um, and you should have every part of your organization working in different little sectors and, and doing that kind of strategy. And I, I kind of see where those folks are coming from. But at the end of the day, especially during COVID, I think it's very important to be centralized and to be able to collaborate and communicate with your team. And it's also very important to have redundancies in place. And that's kind of my strategy with it. And I, I, I want to speak with you about this a little bit. Um, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but that my approach to this stuff is centralize all of your communications and your collaboration so that people have a kind of town square to be able to communicate in. And then take the extra money that you were spending on these six other platforms and use that for redundancy. So in case something happens to your main form of communication, you're able to get that back up and running or avoid downtime altogether. Um, and the reason why I like the idea of centralization is because it's simpler for people. Again, change for the sake of change isn't very good. But if you're going to be able to tell people you don't need to open your email, Slack, Teams, Hangouts, go into box, go into the file server, go here and go there. All you have to do is open up this one SharePoint window and it's gonna show you everything. People are gonna go, okay, it's gonna save me an hour in the morning of jumping around and that one time I got yelled at for missing this one document because I didn't check my seventh platform. Then they're gonna go ahead and jump onto that. Um, is that one of the reasons why you're behind centralization or, or is there other reasons? That, that's one of the reasons, but here's another true story. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with a, with a customer and mm. uh, they called me very concerned one day and usually they don't call it concerned, right? So I usually get a phone call concerned, so they're concerned. So what's happening? So they're about 50 plus organization and uh, they've got a phone call from their customer, mm. uh, to put it nicely uh, demanding, uh, uh, you know, there's something that they've been delivering to this customer and one of the team members left and, you know, few fast forward month or two from now, uh, some decisions were made that nobody remembers how was it some, something was, was signed off, was it not signed off? Long story short, they have, they're getting a phone call from an executive to the, to their executive. They're calling me because they, uh, they don't, they can't retrace, they, they don't know what to do. They should have a version. How can we find it? Where do we find it? Right. Uh, but because they, they were, they had a very simple installation of office 365. They used uh, office 365 for email. They had yeah. SharePoint and they had teams. And one of the things that I showed them is uh, office 365 has this feature that nobody knows and nobody advertises. Right. But in about five minutes, uh, we went to the main center of Office 365, and in five minutes, we launched the audit um, and uh, the content search on entire on entire everybody's email boxes. Uh, as admin, you have access from one one source to search everybody's email boxes, all of the SharePoint sites, all of the Teams channels, and they typed in a domain name, right? So basically, the email address of the company that was kind of uh, 
to put it nicely, demanding an explanation, right? And not just an explanation, a refund. Uh, so, uh, and, and in about five minutes, they got a complete retrace of every, you know, every form of communication and, and you could see exactly what happened, who signed off, what was sent later, what was changed later. So they can reconstruct the entire timeline. Uh, obviously that took them a little bit longer, but at least they had the data. Now imagine if you had a little bit of commu communication somewhere in Google Hangouts, a little bit of communication there, the approval and on paper and, and so on and so forth. Uh, good luck, right? Yeah. But because you're using that one, you now have this access to, to everything. So long story short, fast forward, after five minutes I showed them, they spent an entire week in kind of reconstructing the timeline, but in five minutes they were able to pull up all the information and they were able to explain and and explain, hey, here's what happened, and here is how this turned into this, and then you know what? They saved themselves over hundred thousand dollars just because otherwise they would have to issue issue an if, a refund, right? To for for the unhappy to an unhappy customer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. the The ability to go in and just audit everything in one place because it's centralized is, is so crucial as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any other sort of uh stories about situations where having sharepoint installed has been beneficial for clients oh there's there's lots of stories uh and i speak to customers about you know a couple of times a day and prospects and and customers and uh they're internationally you know they're usually we have a lot of customers in the united states uh there's some in new zealand and uh there's there's a lot of success stories because mainly um uh, these are the customers that you know, and if your organization and you probably, especially if you're an executive level, you probably have this feeling that sometimes, especially if you're growing, right, and the workforce is changing right now, there's a lot of people are uh, changing jobs uh, with, with, with COVID. And uh, if you feel that somehow things are taking longer than they should, right? Like you request something and then it just takes a day. It used to take just like, you could just email someone or you could just ping someone and used to get an answer. But because now uh, either someone's working remotely or someone's, you know, someone has, you know, it's a new person now, uh, things sometimes take longer than usual. You, you lose, a, you, you kind of have this feeling of feeling stuck and not sure what to do. So the huge benefit of uh, using uh, SharePoint and Office 365 suite is that you get that feeling of gaining your control back. And we see a couple of things in a good SharePoint implementation. So we see um, about uh, 40 and dare I say 60% of improvement in, uh, in productivity. Um, so people are just feeling more productive. There, there's less distractions. Um, you get anywhere fast access, right? So we have we had one customer that deployed uh, SharePoint uh, local organization and uh, about fully deployed about four months before before you know March and uh, boy like you know you can access things remotely now right who would have thought that that would have been an issue uh, but now you know it became an issue immediately and they have anytime anywhere access um, people feel also you know more secure and safe uh, in a way that um, you know, you don't have to worry about the laptops being lost and all the documentation is gone, right? Like, how often does it happen that, you know, our phones or uh, devices get, you know, either a phone breaks and you need to replace the screen immediately, or, uh, like, you don't have to worry about the fact that your laptop is lost. You, it's all secure out there in the cloud. Uh, there's a redundancy and backup uh, in place to, to, to protect that. So there's uh, three huge things. So there's the safety and, and, and security of your data. Uh, there's anytime access and fast access and global access from anywhere. And then there's this huge improvement in productivity. That's these are the main things that people are people are seeing. Gotcha. I, I, I do completely agree with you where you mentioned 40% uh, <clears throat> uh, increase in efficiency. Like with us, uh, all the case studies we've done have shown 26 to 30% reduction in labor costs. Uh, after implementing different solutions like this. So whether it's G Suite and you're working with organizational units and share drives, or if you're working inside of Microsoft 365 with groups and SharePoint, um, you'd really do see a tremendous benefit. And I, I've seen a couple of case studies done by Alpine, I believe, uh, which is just a third party that audited, I think it was about 500 businesses that implemented Microsoft 365. And most businesses after, the f after three years, I believe, <clears throat> they noticed a 371% ROI uh, after the implementation. So yep. people may be spending 
tens of thousands, thousands, hundreds of dollars, whatever it is, implementing SharePoint, depending on their size. Um, and again, that cost barrier does come up, but every single time, if it's done properly and if the training is there and if you've laid out your metrics in the beginning, most folks end up seeing 331% ROI, the majority of that coming from labor savings, time saving, workflow saving, all that kind of stuff. So reduced capital and operating expenses essentially. Um, I want to just talk to you very briefly. You mentioned a couple of things there about privacy and security and backups. So um, you mentioned the redundancy. I want to address that first and just clear that up. So um, obviously you have the redundancy of the laptop and the cloud now, um, but what other kind of solutions do you recommend people use for offsite backups of what's in SharePoint? Because <clears throat> in my belief system, just because something is in the cloud doesn't mean that it's safe inherently. And that's a big, big caveat I, I always have to address the people is it's in the cloud. Why do I need a backup? So do you want to uh, dive into that a little bit? Yeah, that's a good question, right? So uh, there's there most of the organizations that we're working with implementing different, um, like they're using some of the out of the box solutions uh, that SharePoint provides. And you know, a lot of times just having a version control uh, on a document uh, or in a library is like, wow, that's so that's so much better, right? Than than mm -hmm. just not having it at all. So for a lot of them, that is uh, that is adequate enough. Uh, and, and version control is what? Sorry, just for the folks that don't know. Uh, so the version control, for example, um, you know, you working on it, you're working on a document, you mm -hmm. keep saving it, and someone else went in there and then just added something, and then you know. Five months down the road, uh, someone made an so someone deleted something, and and you can always retrace, and it's auto save, and it shows exactly what's what's happened, when, and who changed it. Not necessarily that people are maliciously going to do anything, but a lot of times people are just accidentally deleting things, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. So you can just jump back to an older version of the document, pull it up, and do that. I had to do that with a QuickBooks database, for example, last week. Somebody accidentally overwrote a QuickBooks database. I just opened up SharePoint click two buttons, restore to the version that was two hours older before they'd accidentally wiped it. <clears throat> Problem solved, you know, $750 to QuickBooks, super, super easy. So yeah, anyways, yeah. I just wanted to address the, the version control thing there. So back to the redundancy, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so so that's, you know, so for a lot of folks that we're working with, that's uh, that's good enough. And, uh, you know, I'll defer to, to you, Jake, like what are some of the solutions that people are using in terms of a backup uh, yes. for cloud? So we always recommend that your data is in three different places at once, right? It's super, super important to make sure your data is in three places or it's in zero places is the way we kind of explain it. So if you have your data up in SharePoint, then that's one location. If you have it locally shared to your laptop, that's a second location. And then it, technically it's one and a half places because it's live syncing. Um, but number two and number three that I would use is most people, and correct me if I'm wrong on this again, that you're working with are coming from a file server infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we end up doing is setting up that file server to just host file backups because file serving is a very, very low resource uh, need. It's a low resource service. So even if they've got a five year old server, um, it was already handling all their file server needs. We set that up to sync with SharePoint. And then what we can do as well is use separate appliances and separate services um, to do third party cold backups. So from that server and from a, a workstation perhaps, or just from the cloud itself, um, we can back up that information to a third party cold storage location. And what I mean by that is you have your SharePoint site in the cloud, you have your employees working off of that directly or working off of something that is syncing that to, to that directly like their laptops. And then you have the data on a scheduled or on an automatic basis being moved somewhere where it's not being touched. No one is working off of a Google Cloud backup or a Wasabi backup or a B2 bucket backup or a Datto backup or a Drop Suite backup, et cetera. There's a million platforms out there that people can use. Um, we use uh, three to four different ones for every client site, uh, which is a little bit more expensive but it, it ensures ultimate redundancy because again you, you know how important it is people lose this data they lose 25 years of their business it's it's done yeah. um yeah. so the most important thing i can recommend to any business again is to use the three two one backup policy your data has to be in three places at all times 
two of those uh, locations should be uh, active and then one of those should be a cold solution that is away from the active data being used. So very, very important to make sure people follow that policy. Um, because again, what you're doing is so important for people and it's super, super important that uh, people are paranoid with their data and they make sure that it's off site somewhere across two different vendors, one of those vendors being cold and, and not in use. That's very interesting. And what organizations are typically, uh, are typically would you recommend that setup for? A any specific industries that want to have that that uh, level of uh, redundancy? E everybody should use it because everybody. you can do yeah you can do it as simply as using something like Backblaze or CrashPlan. Um, mm -hmm. In Canada, it's a little bit more difficult, but I always recommend people like let's say you have SharePoint set up for somebody. They're a five right. person business. They've got a budget of a thousand dollars to to run this. Um, you know, mm -hmm. very very small. So they've already paid for the six dollars and forty cents a month for their Microsoft three sixty five licenses. They've got SharePoint up and running. It's syncing with all their labs laptops they've got an old computer sitting in the back room that no one's using you take that you put it at the ceo's closet at home set it up yeah. with a little firewall that starts to back up automatically to sharepoint so now you have your t uh, three different locations um, but then you install crash pan plan or backblaze on that server that's costing total ten dollars a month mm. and then that's going to back up off site so in case you get hit by ransomware, in case someone comes in, you have a malicious employee, they delete everything. In case right. something happens to your instance, if someone were to hack the administrative account of Office 365, you can just open up CrashPlan or Backblaze and it's got seven months of backups every day. And it's got mm -hmm. all the same version history control and it's $10 a month. So you can get something like that. You can go with something like Datto which can charge you as much as two thousand dollars a month but if something happens to your sharepoint instance you click one button and everyone immediately has instant remote access to the same files they don't even know that there's an outage uh, somebody that taught me a lot about it um he actually used datto for a long time and he, he was showing me let check this out and he would go in and just kill his entire office's file server and then click a button on his smartphone and get the datto uh, appliance up and running and then he would yeah. call into the office and be like hey guys anything funny going on today and they're like well the server just cut out for about five seconds but we're all up and running again so not sure what happened um, so again, there's a wide variety of solutions for this. And if you're someone like a law firm with 200 uh, employees, you're going to be losing a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars a day in yeah. cases and, and uh, downtime. Then paying twelve hundred bucks a month checks out. You know, it's worth it. Yeah. Um, but oh, if you're yeah. a really small business, then getting a, a basic solution like Crash Plan or Backblaze um, would also be very, very good. So I always yeah. recommend people have that redundancy in place. But um, yeah, does it, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, 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 definitely. It's very interesting. And uh, it's definitely something that a lot of organizations, financial services, uh, legal, anywhere where information is worth a lot, I mean, obviously everywhere, but uh, uh, some industries, they are built on files and information. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you're being regulated by places yeah. like the BC Law Society or the different financial uh, regulations, you need that data for seven years. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter what's going on, right? If you don't have that data when you're getting audited, or if they come over to you and they say, hey, where's your data being stored? Um, yeah. Then it's super, super important to make sure you've been following those uh, regulations and compliance measures. Um, yeah. In terms of the security of SharePoint, um, what would you say are some of the main features and the main things you're considering when you're setting it up to be secure? Because that's another big question I get from a lot of clients is, well, because yeah. it's in the cloud, I'm kind of building my house on someone else's lawn. I don't feel like it's really private or secure. So how, how do you address those concerns? So uh, there's a couple of ways that SharePoint addresses some of these things out of the box. So uh, there's some organizations that we worked with enable, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication. So that means that uh, you um, you have uh, before you log in, it's not just a username and a password. Uh, you have some other mechanism, either it's a phone uh, verification, so SMS or phone call, or uh, an app that that pushes notification and you get to approve whether that's a legitimate sign on. So I know some of our customers that are more concerned about security I have enabled that. Um, so that's one of, one of the ways. Uh, there's of course, you know, once people, you know, there's a plenty of uh, diff especially in organizations that are hundred people, hundred people or so. There's def definitely a lot of data that's. Uh, purview to some people, but not others, right? So financial data, HR data. So we want to make sure that that's um, that you have proper permission within SharePoint 
to to some of these resources. So you don't have employees accessing other people's uh, uh, HR files and, and finding out what their salaries are. So you really want to make sure that that security is, uh, is well set up. And that's some of the things that we're helping uh, uh, organizations as we put together this structure of information is one of the things that I do is I put together this structure of information, how everything's going to be interrelated. And the way you can think of it as a site map, right? Um, we also determine who's the owner, who's going to own this area, who's a backup person, and also um, who are the readers. And, and if that's an area that should have uh, restricted access, then that's a restricted access and we mark it and we set it up that way. SharePoint handles these capabilities out of the box, so you can set up three levels of, uh, of your access. Um, uh, so, so that's one of so the basic thing that you can do. A lot of times people just enable things, just dump everything in one repository. And then of course, SharePoint has wonderful features like search. And anybody who searches, and they find all of these things that you didn't know exist uh, so uh, or shouldn't have uh, been available to everybody. So that's another uh, way to keep in mind that even these rudimentary, very staple features uh, need to be configured. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's so important for people when they're getting this stuff started to make a site map of their association, get yep. organized, understand what the organizational units are when it comes to your association, what groups make up those organizational units, and then yep. what individuals make up those groups so that when you're setting permissions, like you said, you don't have your uh, administrative assistant or the entry level IT guy going, uh, why is this person making 80,000 a year and this guy's making 150, you know, cause then you run into a whole bunch of problems or again, it can be even worse than that, right? You can have people yeah. just getting into budget files that they shouldn't be. Yeah. And again, maliciously or accidentally messing around with things. Yeah. I had, uh, one office assistant, um, when we came into a place, uh, before we'd set everything up, she accidentally deleted, I think it was like seven years worth of budgets. Um, because the previous person had just set it up where everyone could access everything and it was just yeah. an honor system where it was you know you're not supposed to go into this folder silly yeah. and yeah. one day she was like um I dropped coffee and I hit the keyboard and now all the budgets are gone what am I supposed to do and it's just like okay well here we'll just go in restore it from the, the recycle bin, yeah. do an audit figure out where you moved everything and then you're ready to go yeah. um, so that, that addresses the internal stuff like you said um, and internally another question I get a lot is is this more secure than a file server? Um, so what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so, you know, depends how secure is your file server. Uh, one of the things that I like about, uh, you know, obviously a file server is easy access and it's, and it's folders and everybody's used to it. It's, it's a simple technology and uh, people visually don't see any, any difference. In terms of, obviously, one of the biggest complaints that I have in terms of uh, SharePoint is it's a little bit slower in terms of you accessing your files. But not if you're using tools, for example, like OneDrive, which mimics that file structure uh, for you. And, and you, you can see it as if it was a file server, uh, but it's actually living in a cloud. And it has some really good features in terms of backup and restore and version control, which we talked about earlier. Um, so, so you kind of mimic that benefit. Uh, in terms of the security, um, you know, here, here's, you know, obviously uh, with tools like uh, OneDrive or a couple of other, you know, even Dropbox, for example, you can share a um, a document with, uh, you know, within or link to a document within an organization uh, or outside an organization. Depending on the policies, you can turn that on or off. Uh, that's something that's harder to do with, you know, with something like a file server. You need to create a user account for someone, and uh, you need to make sure that they have, um, you know, that they have access only to this resource and nothing else, and permissions, and then. Uh, you need to take that access away because you know you don't want a bunch of usernames uh, sitting around in your you know having access to your to your file system. So there's a little bit of uh, management from Microsoft when it comes to Office 365 and SharePoint how you can manage the file uh, access to files. Uh, but of course, the key to using all these features, as you mentioned earlier, is having right kind of policies, right? So when you're enabling something like that, um, think about whether you know we want to enable just anonymous access with everybody with the, with the link uh, or you want to lock it down a little bit to help users protect themselves from not knowing enough about technology and making a mistake that inadvertently exposes the company. Exactly. I, th I think that's huge. And you can even restrict the ability for people to send things externally if they're part of different groups, um, etc. So for example, if I wanted to share a letter of intent with someone or something like that. Um, I can just right click in, in OneDrive, click the share button, 
type in their email, say, I want to share this with this specific person, or I want to share it with anyone that has this link um, and a multitude of other options, share that off. And then my administrator could get an alert that says, hey, this person just shared something with somebody external. You need to talk to them or it'll just say someone shared this externally, whatever, no big deal. Um, so again, I think that's super important. And then one other thing that I would I'd really want to touch on is, in my opinion, again, once you have multi-factor authentication set up, like you mentioned earlier, um, if you get people set up uh, on OneDrive and everyone is socially trained on how to use it properly, I believe it's more secure than a file server um, for one reason. Uh, in, in this one specific regard, I should say, because it is pros and cons on both sides of that argument. Um, but the main reason I would say is because your small business, uh, most likely if they're hiring someone like you or I, has no or a very small IT team. Like if you're bringing in a managed services provider, you now have a team of IT people that are gonna be doing their best to make sure everything is working. Like with us, for example, you get a team of seven people ready to go, da 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 but Microsoft and Google have thousands of data engineers working on new encryption methods to protect each file individually. They're constantly yeah. looking at zero days, constantly fixing things. So again, I don't like the idea of building my house on someone else's lawn, but because you get all these extra benefits and because it is so secure, um, I'm not worried about the security aspect of OneDrive. And again, as long as you have those backups in place and that redundancy plan there and the disaster recovery plans, then I have absolutely no concern with people using SharePoint. And like you said, it is very, very simple to administrate that and set up sharing versus a conventional file server. Um, something else that you really briefly touched on that I want to kind of dig into um, is the analytics side of SharePoint. So as people are using this, I'm a big fan of the, the project method PPDIOO, which is prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. So we've kind of gone through every aspect of this except for the optimizing part. So let's say that somebody has SharePoint implemented, they're 18 months into it, it's been working awesome, everyone keeps saying they love it, everyone is, is noticing, hey, I'm doing 30% less mundane bullcrap, and I'm able to just work and do what I love to do. Um, how do you recommend people use the SharePoint analytics, use the Microsoft 365 analytics um, to further improve their employees' experience, improve efficiency, and really focus on the 20% of uh, SharePoint that's getting the most use? and uh, continue to kind of leverage that success and keep the momentum going? That's a really good question. It's something that often people overlook because, uh, you know, it just comes kind of like, oh yeah, what about what about how we're gonna measure this? So uh, there's a couple of built-in options for analytics uh, in SharePoint, and they tell you how many employees are using it uh, and, and what services they're using. So for example, uh, I love looking at these analytics and we watch them, uh, especially, uh, well, for our, for our customers when you know the pandemic or March 18th or whatever that day for everyone is, uh, has hit and uh, we saw a huge spike in uh, basically 100% of organizations, uh, employees within organizations were uh, accessing the internet. So it was really interesting how people are, uh, the usage patterns, how people are uh, accessing. Uh, also, one of the things that I really love because uh, that, you know, a lot of times I speak to communications uh, directors and they say, well, what is the most effective way uh, to use SharePoint to communicate? One of the things that analytics can help you is can help you determine when is the most optimal time for your employees. Well, when, are they, when do they log in? So one of the things that I found with most of our customers, uh, employees log in around 8 a.m. for sure. Everybody's logging in at mm. 8 a.m. Um, so that's probably a really good time for you to post uh, organizational announce announcements or changes, right? So that's when you have the most eyes on the on the thing, and uh, uh, so why not use that time? Another thing is that if people are using SharePoint and they're using on their phone, uh, right? They, there's ability to, to for employees to have a mobile app. Um, uh, SharePoint pushes. Uh, notifications to the phone so you get your standard push notification and that increases uh, um, according to analytics and increases uh, engagement even further so there's uh, so there's really good kind of analytics that help you optimize what kind of resources are people uh, 
more, mostly engaging with, right? So what kind of news they want to they want to see more, and we have some suggestions around that as well. Like you know, for example, one of the things that people love um, uh, are relating more to news that uh, show other people, right? Or things like changes within an organization, something that relates to them directly rather than just kind of a passive FYI type of thing. But also, uh, when should they post it? How often? Uh, and uh, and consistency is a huge thing. So that's these are the things that come with analytics. There's also some admin analytics that help you uh, see the growth uh, of you know how people are you know how people are engaging more in terms of uh, um, you know what's the what's the percentage of people that are just kind of passively reading information versus writing information. So so that's uh, these analytics are available as well. One of the things that we focus on as a company, Origami, um, on the type of analytics is that one of the biggest questions that, and this is how we started doing these analytics, is um, w how do I know that whatever we set up is that you know is that how people are relating to content? Can people actually find things when they were looking for them? Right. So, for instance, if I if I need something and I go on the SharePoint site and I can't find it, chances are nobody's going to ever know about that. Right. No one will ever hear me being frustrated. Uh, occasionally, we'll share stories in a staff room or whatever. And uh, nowadays, everybody's offline. You can't even, you know, you can't even talk to anyone about it. But uh, so we we saw that a lot of people are quite dissatisfied with the setup, but because they can't find things that they, you know, uh, on on their SharePoint, but they don't really voice that. So there's the productivity of you rolling out SharePoint is not it doesn't give you the full potential. So one of the things, anyway. Going back to my original thing about analytics is one of the things that we do with analytics. We, when we roll out, for example, a SharePoint site, we uh, give we test the setup that we have. So all of this site map, the structure, with 10% uh, of user population. So that gives us really good data in terms of when we ask them a question, we'll find an employee handbook. Where would you go and find an employee handbook? And we we see where do they go and how do they interact with the with the site map. We can make these small adjustments specific to uh, to the uh, organization to help them the mo to optimize the sitemap the most fit uh, to to the organization that we're deploying this to. So this is additional layer of analytics that's available uh, that we're doing, for example, on the top of these kind of cool analytics of when everybody's reading what. So we're focusing more kind of on um, how make it more how to make it more intuitive. Mm -hmm. so there, that's another layer of, of analytics that's possible. Uh, I think that you're dead on there. And I always fall back to the Pareto principle when it talks about this. The Pareto principle is no, also known as the 80-20 principle. So 20% of anything is equal to 80% of the results. So, for example, 20% of, the, of a pride of lions gets 80% of the meat. 20% of trees in a forest get 80% of the sunshine. 20% of the system inside of SharePoint gets 80% of the activity. And my favorite one that everyone has a good laugh at uh, is 20% of the employees in your business do 80% of the work. Um, so it's very, very important, I think, um, for people to understand that you can use these tools inside of SharePoint to figure out the 20% of the system is getting 80% of the attention. And if you mm. can really figure out what that 20% is and hyper focus on that, you can get adoption rates to spike. You can get usage to spike. People are going to love it. Um, and it's really important to focus on that. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, is there anything else you want to discuss? Uh, anything you want to promote? Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah, so there's a couple of resources that I wanted to share if you mm -hmm. wanted to find out more. So Microsoft has uh, 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 now this September a free online conference. So it used to be a conference that you go to register and pay a couple of thousand dollars to go and, 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 and visit uh, and find out more about more about it. So now it's called Microsoft Ignite. So now this September, from what I've checked, uh, uh, you can attend the conference for free. Definitely a great uh, place to find out all about what Microsoft is doing with SharePoint and other uh, products that they have, such as Teams and Office 365 and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, also check out my blog uh, at uh, www.origamiconnect.com slash blog. Um, I write a lot about um, you know just best practices of rolling things out. For example, one of the most popular contents is like six 
templates that that will help you uh, adopt uh, SharePoint most efficiently. Or, for example, what should you put on a homepage, right? And these are these come from actual customer questions that I'm receiving, you know, hundreds of these uh, over years now. And these are some really good articles that will help you kind of understand what should you do and, and very practical and with illustrations and examples. So uh, that's another thing I wanted to share. And uh, yeah. That's awesome. I'm going to make sure we throw the links in the description down for everybody there so they can go check that stuff out. And again, I, I really do appreciate your time, Yaroslav. Thank you so much for coming on. And I really, really hope people do go check out that blog, origamiconnect.com, because I know myself, I'm going to go check that out after this because that's a huge struggle for a lot of my clients is what does a good implementation of an intranet look like? And like you said, these frequently asked questions we get asked all the time by people. So everybody, please make sure to go check that out. And uh, again, I think that does it for today's interview. Um, I hope everybody kind of has a fresh perspective on how to design their own intranet and how to get started with SharePoint. And I'm very, very thankful that uh, Yaroslav from Origami Software was able to take the time and speak with us about this today. So thank you so much, Yaroslav. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jake. No worries. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. And I think that does it for today's video. If you could please leave a like on this video, it really helps us out. If you want to see more videos like this, then please hit subscribe. If you have a suggestion for a future video or a guest you'd like to see on the show, please leave a comment down below or email us at techtips at umbrellaitservices.ca. Have a great day and see you all soon.